In 1984, NASA intentionally crashed a passenger jet to test a new fuel that was designed to not ignite during a crash. It didn't exactly go to plan. However, it's not quite the failure it appears to be. When a plane crashes, it's generally not the impact that causes the most fatalities. It's the inferno that follows as the aircraft's fuel tanks split open, releasing their contents. Following the deadliest plane crash to date, where two passenger jets collided on a runway killing 583 people, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, began taking a closer look at post-crash survival of passengers. They concluded that in the average crash, there are about 90 seconds for people to evacuate before the ensuing fire would envelop the aircraft. To increase survivability in these kinds of crashes, half the battle is ensuring a speedy exit from the aircraft, and the other half is buying time. This is where anti-misting kerosene came in. Anti-misting kerosene, AMK for short, was a mix of standard jet fuel and an additive that had the intended effect of reducing the likelihood of fire following a crash. Lab tests had been promising, showing that AMK was much less likely to aerosolize and substantially less likely to ignite than standard jet fuel. There was, however, a bit of a drawback. The AMK fuel could not be introduced directly into the jet engines, instead needing to be passed through a device called a degrader, which essentially turned it back into standard jet fuel. This will be important later. In order to test the real-world effectiveness of AMK fuel, the FAA enlisted the help of NASA to crash a plane. Why NASA? Well, NASA does a lot more than just spaceflight, and they are also not new to crash-testing aircraft. The plan they developed was called the Controlled Impact Demonstration, informally known as the Crash in the Desert. It came to fruition in December of 1984. Four years in the making, it consisted of an aging Boeing 720, fuel tanks full of AMK, a specially prepared gravel runway on a dried lake bed near a Californian airbase, and eight wing cutters. The aircraft, flown remotely, was to touch down on the lake bed, engines at idle, wings level, ensuring a relatively gentle impact. Shortly after impact, the aircraft would slide into eight posts, cemented into the runway. These cutters were designed to slice into the wings, releasing the fuel inside and testing how it performs in a real-world situation. During the test, a total of 350 sensors would report detailed data back to the ground, whilst numerous high-speed cameras would record this once-in-a-lifetime test. Well, that was the plan. What actually occurred was a little different. The aircraft contacted the ground, left wing low, at full throttle, with the nose of the aircraft pointing to the left of the centerline, instead of the wings level, engines at idle, plan. As the left wing dug into the ground, the aircraft rotated as it slid, which meant that when it reached the wing cutters, it was at about a 45 degree angle. As the aircraft impacted the wing cutters, a huge fireball erupted which was exactly what the anti-missing kerosene was designed to prevent. This fireball engulfed the aircraft and took over an hour to extinguish. After an investigation, the FAA concluded that approximately a quarter of the passengers could have survived, but that the anti-missing kerosene did not sufficiently reduce the risk of fire. Following this incident, the idea of introducing the AMK additive as a requirement was dropped by the FAA. It might be easy to chalk this whole debacle up to poor flying, but that would be really rather unfair. The NASA test pilot in charge of the aircraft was one Fitzhugh Lee Fulton Jr., Fitz for short. His flight career was vast. He participated in atomic bomb tests, the X-15 program, the Valkyrie program, even the YF-12 research program. He was quite clearly an accomplished pilot, but he had a lot of factors working against him. This was the setup he had to control the aircraft. Notice the small television, meaning no appreciable depth perception. He had no heads-up display, no microwave landing system, and because of all the sensors and cameras having already been triggered, there was no second chance. In the end, both NASA and the FAA concluded that what the pilot was asked to do was incredibly challenging, given the tools at his disposal, and they laid no blame at his feet. But this test wasn't the utter failure that it appeared to be. The way that the aircraft slid at an angle into the wing cutters drastically changed the experiment. The test was supposed to have the wing cutters miss the engines, but instead one sliced straight through the number 3 engine. 
This released large amounts of lubricating oil, hydraulic fluid, and raw jet fuel. As previously mentioned, the AMK fuel had to be converted back into standard jet fuel before being fed into the engines. The fuel being released from the engine was no longer the AMK fuel. It was raw and very flammable. You can also see that as the aircraft slides sideways, the leading wing created a vortex, mixing fuel and air. As both the raw fuel and AMK fuel swirl together, the AMK degraded. The process of being swirled about in the vortex essentially converted the AMK back into standard jet fuel. As visually impressive as the Inferno was, it didn't last all that long. Whilst the fire took an hour to extinguish, the airborne fire that engulfed the fuselage only lasted 8 seconds, leaving the fuselage relatively undamaged. In most plane crashes, if the fuel tanks are breached, you would expect what is known as a pool fire. The burning fuel spreads outwards from the wreckage, causing an intense and sustained fire. That didn't occur with the anti-mist and kerosene. The fire remained relatively contained. The test crash ended up being much more extreme than planned, and therefore it was generally considered to be unrepresentative of the type of crash that would benefit from AMK. Whilst the AMK test was certainly the most visible of the tests, it certainly wasn't the only experiment. It wasn't even the primary experiment from NASA's point of view. NASA's primary test was regarding structural crashworthiness, and there was a whole host of additional experiments being run on board. As the aircraft touched down, sensors on the bottom of the fuselage experienced around 32 Gs, but as the impact forces travelled up the body of the aircraft, they were reduced to around 7 Gs. This is due to the forces being absorbed by the body of the aircraft compressing and crushing. The angle at which the aircraft touched down meant that the nose of the plane was subjected to greater impact forces than the rest of the aircraft. This meant the crash test dummy in the cockpit was subjected to forces of 18 G which bring with it a risk of spinal injury, but that was the worst impact force experienced by any of the dummies within the aircraft. The passenger dummies throughout the rest of the plane only had around 6 Gs of force to deal with, which is fairly minor in regards to human tolerances. The structural load experiments were basically over by the time the aircraft impacted those wing cutters, although it did provide more data. The impact of the wing cutters were actually more severe in all axes, but all were still well within the limit of human tolerance. During the ensuing fire, another set of experiments came into effect. Experiments into the resilience of fire-resistant material were conducted, from seats with fire-blocking layers to heat-resistant window panes. Following the analysis of the crash, the FAA instituted new flammability standards for airline seats, so that they would perform better than those tested in this experiment. Further experiments included tests of the overhead bins, the emergency lighting system, seats, and the seat belts. Another experiment aboard the aircraft was a test of multiple black boxes. Black boxes are properly known as flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders, and they record data about the aircraft and the voices of the pilots. These devices, which funnily enough are actually painted orange, not black, are exceedingly resilient. So in the case of a crash, they are intended to survive and provide valuable information to the crash investigators. So there we have it, NASA's controlled impact demonstration of December 1984. As we've seen, it didn't quite go according to plan, but nor was it the failure it initially appeared to be. If you liked the video, perhaps consider subscribing. 